You know, just you don't come here just to hear a speaker. You come here because you want to hear the Holy Spirit, and you want the Holy Spirit to change you, to transform you. Because we're living in a time, like David said, we're living in a time where the church has become carnal, and the world comes into the church and is destroying the church. You know, we need people that are spiritual, that will make a stand, make a stand for Christianity, to be those men and women, actually men, that are going to be ruling their homes and being in charge of that home in, in love as, uh, as God is going to do that. Let me begin by reading. I want to speak to you about Jesus' praise in Gethsemane. I think that's really important for me. But let me begin by reading. I'm reading from the NIV here. It says, And they came to an olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, Sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be filled with horror and deep distress. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell face down on the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want, you, I want your will, not my will. And then he returned and found the disciples sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you sleeping? Could you not wake or could you not stay awake and watch with me even one hour? Keep alert and pray. Otherwise, temptation will overpower you. For though the spirit is willing enough, the body is weak. And then Jesus left them again and prayed, repeating his pleadings. And again, he returned to them and found them sleeping for they just couldn't keep their eyes open. And then he says, and they didn't know what to say. And when he returned to them the third time, he said, still sleeping, still resting, enough. The time has come that I, the Son of Man, I am betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. You know, when I think of uh, Jesus, I don't know if you ever had someone, not only that you love, but has been taken away from you. I think that's one of the hardest things that a person can experience. When you love someone so dearly, so powerful, they've been in your life, that you come to that place that, you know, you not only miss them, but it hurts you. It actually kills you. It hurts your heart. It breaks your heart. And then, I, 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 again, imagine the love that he had for the world. Jesus. He loved his disciples. He loves you today here. He loves me. And he took the cross. He took the cross as not only a place of sacrifice. I don't know if you ever have sacrificed your life for someone else. But I had in Vietnam 41 guys sacrifice their life for America. And it was probably the most hard, the hardest thing in my life. Because I love these guys and they became part of my life. And then the Lord ministered to me the other day. You know, when you're in the world, it seems that the, I, the guys that I was with, they cared for you. We cared our dead and our wounded, never leaving anybody behind. The church doesn't do that today. The church needs to get close to the heart of God. The church needs to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus submitted to the Father. Submitted to the Father that he would go to the cross. And the reason is because he loved them. And he loved us. Continually loving us. In John 3, 16, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life forever and ever and ever. That's something that I'm looking for in my life. You know, to go to heaven, to be with Pastor Chuck, to be with my mother that just passed away the last two years, my father, and my little brother that died when I was probably about 
uh, five years old. And I guess within each one of our lives here today, you know, I don't know how much you love your family, you love your friends, and I hope you don't love yourself. Because a lot of times we have more love for ourselves than we have for our family and for Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So when I read the first time John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, it really, it really touched my heart because I was full of hate in my life. I hated my family. I hated people. I became very bitter. I was locked up for six months up in Oakland Naval Hospital because I did not know how to get back into society. But you know, the Lord had a plan for my life, a plan for my life. The girl that was writing to me in Vietnam, now my wife, that we had met in, in, in high school, I never thought she was going to be my wife. But God had a plan, even though I was a heathen, God had a plan for my life. Becoming a Christian, becoming a pastor, and sitting here and ministering to you guys. And maybe you're sitting here this morning, and you really don't know what God has for you. But God has a plan for your life, like he had a plan for the disciples. Imagine Jesus being sent by the Father into this world. Into this world so that you and I could have eternal life. And when he came into the world, he submits to the Father's will. He comes down to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane, with, the, with all these guys that not only he loves, and he's been walking with them for three years, and he tells Peter, James, and John to come with him. So they go with him. And then Jesus begins on the side to begin to pray because he's going to the cross. He prays in the garden pleading with the Father. He is submitting to the Father's will. In a deep, deep suffering that he's going to be bearing, he says, not my will, but your will. I want to say that to you today. Not my will, but his will. I want to follow the road to the cross. It's very painful to follow the cross because you have to die to yourself. A lot of times when we think of Christianity, we don't see people really dying to themselves. When you die to yourself, you begin to submit and follow God's will. His will was to come here and to die for your sins. He met Peter, James, and John when he called them to minister. They followed him and the others. And they were learning about Christianity. They were learning on how Jesus would use their lives. But they never thought that Jesus would suffer as he did. They were looking for a kingdom. A kingdom where they would not only maybe rule in the kingdom. But Jesus not only had this thing in his heart and his mind, because when he looked at the world, he saw people, he saw you, he saw me for the future, for us to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And maybe you're here today, you don't know Christ. Man, you don't know what you're missing. I've become a sissy, so I give to Christ. <laughs> uh -huh. But Jesus begins to pray in his first prayer. He struggles to pray. He feels his soul is crushed with sorrow. He prays, if it's possible, his terrible cup of suffering might be removed in my life. And then they came to that place again, which was called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, you guys, please pray. Please pray. As he reaches his destination on the, west, on the western part of the Mount of Olives, this was one of the favorite places where they would go and spend time in prayer. Spend time talking to one another. And when you think of the name Gethsemane, it means the oil press for crushing oil of olives and referred to the garden filled with olive trees, a slope on the Mount of Olives, which I've been there so many times when I go to Israel. But you know, one of the things, when I go to Israel and I, I sit on the Mount of Olives, 
looking over the city. And I begin to walk down to the Garden of Gethsemane. When I go there and I spend time, it reminds me of the suffering that he went through. And the reason is because of the love that he had for you, that he had for me. Loving his disciples, as he says to them, stand here, and then I'll be coming in a moment. He goes and he prays, and it came, you know, when you talk about prayer, it can be translated prayer, ask, or inquire. He wanted to inquire from the Father, Father, are you sure you want to do this in my life? I came to die for this world. Father, show me. Show me, Father, if I'm going to go into trouble, suffering. He says in verse 33, and they took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. He reads the word trouble there. It means to refer to feeling of terrified amazement. Terrified amazement. As he takes the three, the inner circle with him, Peter, James, and John, imagine how Peter, James, and John must have felt. He takes his disciples to get them to pray in the situation that he's facing, the cross. The cross, the instrument of death. To go to the cross and to die for the sins of the world. To say, Father, forgive them because they really don't know what they're doing. And Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 1.17 says, For Christ did not send me to be baptized, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are bearing who are being saved, it is the power of God. The power of God. The power that has transformed your life, my life. And I think that in these last days, a lot of people don't really understand suffering, pain. Yeah, because there's a lot of people out there hurting. You might be here today. A lot of times we're afraid or maybe embarrassed to tell people, there will be in distress, and the word distress means here to be alarmed or to be amazed, distress to be alarmed or amazed, but the word trouble, a strong term indicating severe distress and anguish. Anguish. Philippians 2.26 says, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick, speaking of someone being sick. He told the three disciples that his soul was not only self-conscious life, was overwhelmed with such a sorrow, deeply, deeply grieved. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. You know, I tell people, you know, when you're going to spend time with the Lord, get rid of your computer. Get rid of your iPad. Get rid of your phone. Choose a place where you can be alone. Where you give an opportunity for Jesus to speak to you. He has a lot to say to you. One of the things that he'll tell you is that he loves you. He cares for you. He wants you to be a servant. He wants you to be a messenger of the truth. He wants you to look up and to understand that one day you will spend eternity with him. And the reason is because he came to die for the sins of the world. A deep hurt that he had. And the reality is, was not only nearly too much for him, but for the, to, in order to survive. Father, please, please, do you want me to go to the cross? Soul, exceedingly sorrowful, even to death, to stay there three times and pray. 
all the disciples should have been praying, but they were sleeping. You know, a lot of times we really don't believe what God has said in his word. But imagine being there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Knowing, recognizing that in a few minutes the Romans are going to come. And one of your own is coming. And he has, these, he actually has turned Jesus in. He's betrayed him. I don't know if you've ever been betrayed, but it's painful. Someone that you trusted. Someone that you loved. And yet Judas Iscariot did not care. He carried the money for the disciples. Jesus trusted him. And yet he became a traitor. He betrayed him. And he traded him. When you betray someone. I don't really know how people can sleep when you're actually betraying someone, especially family, friends. Because it says that he went a little further. And he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. See, Jesus was teaching us to get on our faces. To get on our faces and pray and wait for him to do whatever he wants in my life. <laughs> whatever. I've told the Lord. Lord, in the, in the time that I have left, my wife, she has cancer. And they just found uh, five spots in her liver. One is growing. And we understand. We understand the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ. That if Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, why should we not go to the Garden of Gethsemane? We're not special. We're not special. Jesus. Jesus was there hurting, loving people, caring for people. And when he prayed, the Father, the Father heard his prayer, but the Father wanted him to die on the cross. For you, for me, for my wife, for my kids, for my, my grandchildren, for this church, for my church, for every church. And when you come to that place that you understand, the design that is not I, but Christ crucified. You know that is his will. The great pain that he went through. In verse 35, it says, He went a little further, he fell on his ground and, play, and prayed. That if it was possible, the hour will pass from him. Jesus talking to the Father. And then his submission. Marking the record only a brief summary of it. He emphasized that he desires his Father's will above his own. I love that. The Father's will above his own. Here is Jesus God. And he says in verse 36, And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. The word Abba here is an Aramaic term in, of endearment and, and, and intimacy equivalent to Papa. That's what my grandkids call me, Papa, Daddy. Uh, 
And when you say, Papa, please forgive me for my sins. In Romans 8.15, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Abba, Father. Galatians 4.6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Abba, Father. The scripture speaks to us. The cup is called the cup of the Lord's fury. Isaiah 51, 17 says, Awake, awake, send up, O Jerusalem. He says, You have drunk of the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the, the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. The cup is associated with suffering and God's wrath. You see, God's wrath, he really doesn't want to come, he doesn't want to bring his wrath upon anybody, but he wants to bring his love. The love that he has for you, the love that he has for me. And when he took that cup, associating with the suffering, of God's wrath, Psalm 11, 6 says, Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and the burning wind shall be the portion of the cup. The cup is also associated with salvation. Psalm 116, 13 says, I will take up the cup of salvation. And call upon the name of the Lord. And because Jesus drank the cup of suffering, the wrath for us, we can what is the wrath for us, we can take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, touch my life. Lord, save me. Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, you are my king, my Lord, and my Savior. He comes back and they're sleeping. And the Lord says to them, Then he came and he found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon Peter, Are you sleeping? Could you not watch for one hour? How many times when I supposed to be praying, I'm sleeping? Sleeping spiritually? The enemy likes for sure when we're going to pray to come against us. He doesn't want us to have fellowship with God. But that fellowship with God is very important to become one with Him. In the exhortation that He brings to them, could you not be watching for one hour? There was no excuse for them to be sleeping. Because as they slept, Peter, after that, would betray the Lord. Because he didn't pray. You know, when we pray, we have strength, we have power to the things we're going to be facing. You know, I've been facing in my life for the last 11 years something that I never expected to have because I've always been healthy, seizures. The seizures that I get, I don't pass out, but the seizures that I have in my life, they come from my navel, I feel from my navel to my brain, and my navel, when it hits the, my brain, all of a sudden I can't speak, I can't read, so I have to wait, and when I come back, I mumble, so I step up the pulpit, and I'll have somebody else take the pulpit. And to me, that's embarrassing. It's the cross of Jesus Christ that keeps me going. The cross of Jesus Christ, you guys. It says in the scripture, God is for us who can be against us. No excuses, no matter what you're going through, to pray. To pray, to pray, and to pray. And when you pray, you're in fellowship with God. 
Because as he comes to verse 38, he says, watch, be on the alert and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our flesh is weak. Where he uses the word here, keep watching, meant to stay alert, not only physically, but also spiritually. Lest they enter into temptation. This anticipates the testing as they would face at his arrest and his trial. Peter, the great warrior, denied the Lord three times. Three times. And guess what? Jesus forgave him. He forgave him. And the reason he forgave him is because of the love that Jesus had for him, for Peter. And I would pray this, this morning. Then in verse 41 to 42, he says, Then he came the third time, and he said to them, He says, Are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up and be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Imagine how he must have felt when he saw Judas leading 500 torches and swords. And to come to the Mount of Olives, and when he saw Jesus, to come up to him and kiss him. A traitor. But let us not look at Judas. Let's look at you and me. Are you a traitor? Do you want Jesus Christ to be your King and your Lord and Savior? Or will you be here today? And when you leave here, you'll kiss Jesus. But you'll leave without Jesus. Just like Judas. And I would pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to you that when you do that, and you come to Jesus Christ, that you remember the cross. John Watson said this. The cross is not only the symbol for the life of men. It is equally symbol for the life of God, and then maybe indeed be set. That the cross is the heart of God. The heart of God, the cross. 